Matthew chapter 12. Uh, verses, we're going to do verses 15 to 23. <clears throat> it's not going to be a lot. <clears throat> All right. Let's get rolling here. Okay, and let's read real quick, and then after we'll uh, pray, all right? Okay, you guys there? Yes, no? Man, it's just you two that's saying yes. Yes or no? Come on, you guys. You guys got to wake up. All right, let's read. Verse 15, it says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from them, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was in which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and his name Gentiles would trust. Verse 22, it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and um, what a blessing, Lord, it is to come here, Lord, and to um, go um, hear your word, Lord. We pray, Father God, Lord, that um, you may speak through me, Lord, that it may be all of you and none of me, Lord, that I may decrease, Lord, and you may increase, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we may have open ears, Lord, and open hearts, Lord, for um, what you want to speak to um, us this morning, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we, you allow us, Lord, to um, have a blessed day, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. All right, so um, last week, uh, if, you guys were, some, if you guys were here, um, we were all combined. And Jabbar was teaching. Um, so, we're um, moving forward now. Um, so, as right here where we start, um, in verse 15, uh, we see that <clears throat> Jesus here obviously withdrew because as where Jabbar left off, last week if we read in verse 14, it says, And the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, how they might destroy him. So Jesus knew, obviously, that the Pharisees were not, obviously, in tune with Jesus. They didn't like him. At first they did, but obviously they moved forward and didn't. All right, so it says right here that Jesus knew it and he withdrew. Many times in the scriptures we see that Jesus withdraws from people, withdraws from the crowd. Uh, as we see, and you know, if you guys are writing notes, you guys might, might want to jot these down. So you guys can read them later. We read it in in Mark. Hey, Jabbar, do you, is there a black marker back there? In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and Luke, Luke 5, 16. If you guys have a chance, you guys can read it. Um, in, in many times in scriptures, we see that Jesus withdrew from the crowd or withdrew from those who wanted to cause harm to him, many times in the scriptures. Um, as we continue reading, it says, And great multitudes followed him. Many times in the scriptures we also read that multitudes followed Jesus. Why? Because Jesus obviously loved the crowd, loved the multitude, loved the people that were following him. And it says right here, And he healed them. Many times in the scriptures we also read that Jesus healed them. We see um, many, in many scriptures how Jesus had love and compassion for the sick, for, for those who were blind and mute. If you guys can turn to uh, Psalms 147, we're going to read verse 3. It's a small verse, but many times in Psalms we can read how Jesus had a heart for the broken. All right? Psalms 147, 
147. Verse 3. I'm going to wait for you guys. Guys there? Okay. And it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. It's a small verse. But right here, it sums up everything that Jesus came to do. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to heal those who were lost. As, as example, us. Oh, dang. As, as us. We obviously were um, sick, but Jesus came to heal the sick and the brokenhearted, which is us. We, when we come to accept the Lord, we come with a broken heart. We come with a broken spirit. And when, when Jesus comes into our lives, he heals us. He brings us together. He binds up our wounds. Not physical wounds. Sometimes it's, it's emotional wounds that we have. I know, as for us leaders, we, we recognize the, 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 the emotional wounds that we carry. And sometimes those wounds are, leave scars for us. Like Jesus, Jesus, he had physical wounds. He got crucified to the cross. For us, all those wounds that we carried, he carried upon himself as well. Okay, so, and you guys can turn this uh, page back, 145. We're going to be verse 8 through 9. Okay, uh, you guys there? It's just a page back. Psalms 145. Okay, and it reads... Jesus is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. So we see here in this verse how it explains this, how, how merciful and how compassionate God is to us. That he has so much love for us, that he's willing to pick us up, like the Good Samaritan. You guys know the story of the Good Samaritan? Yes, no, come on, not to me. Yes, okay. Many people passed by him, even though he, he was hurt, right? But just like Jesus, Jesus was a good Samaritan, that should be us as well. We should be willing to help up our brother. Even though he's not our brother, but we should be willing to give him a hand, all right? Now, if you guys can go back to Matthew real quick. So we see how Jesus healed the multitudes, but then he warns them. It says in verse 16, yet he warned them not to make him known. All right? Not to make him known. Why? Because his time had not yet come. His time for him to, to come out in public had not yet come. Even though he was outside among the multitudes, his time had not yet come. Many times in scriptures we see how he warns um, either his disciples Either the people he heals. Um, uh, I don't know if I should give you guys all the scriptures, but I will anyways. I'll just give you guys some. Write them down, and I'll explain them to you guys. Mark. Um, actually, turn, turn to Mark 8, verse 29 through 30. Mark 8. Oh, man, it's too close to the edge. Okay. <clears throat> Mark 8. Okay, and here we're going to read how Jesus warns his disciples not to make him known. Okay, Mark 8, verse 29, it says, mm, actually, we're going to read from verse 27, all right? It says, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Verse 28 says, So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elijah and others, one of the prophets. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? He was getting personal with them now. And, it said, and Peter said, answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Um, then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So right here he warns them not to tell anyone, not to make him known, because his time had not yet come. Because God had perfect time for everything. 
just like the scriptures say, God is not slack. Right? God has a perfect time. Now, you guys can write these other scriptures down, um, like in Mark 1, 4, 40 through 44, uh, when Jesus healed a leper. A leper came to him and said, God, if you're willing, you can heal me. And he healed him. Now, Jesus warned him again not to make him known, but obviously the leper didn't obey, and he went out and and it says right here that the leper went out proclaiming what Jesus had done to him. All right? And, and we'll jot this one down to Mark 1, verse 34, and also chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. We also can read, um, but in this scripture we read that Jesus strictly warned the demons not to speak about him. He warned the demons because you know the demons know who Jesus is, right? Now, Jesus healed the demon-possessed man, but he told the demons, look, do not speak of me because his time had not yet come. All right? So if we go back to Matthew, we're going to continue forward. Matthew chapter 12. Okay, and it says, uh, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken in Isaiah. Now, Jesus came, in this verse we read how Jesus came to fulfill Scripture. Now, Jesus came to fulfill Scripture to the key. All right, we read it in Matthew chapter 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be going back and forth from books, okay? That's what I do, all right? So, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. We're going to read what it says here. All right, and it says, this is Jesus speaking, all right? This is Jesus talking to his disciples. It says, he says, do you think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets? I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill Verse 18 says, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not a jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is all fulfilled. So there's many prophecies in Scripture that Jesus came to fulfill. For instance, uh, this one right here in chapter 12. Now, this here what we're going to read, through, from verse 18 to verse 21, if you jot it down, it's from Isaiah, verse 42, verse 1 through 4. Let me write that down. It's Isaiah. I'm going to write it up here. I think I spelled that right. Yeah. Isaiah, verse 42, verse 1 through 4. All right, that's where it's from. Now, Jesus, th this scripture was written many, many years before Jesus was ever born. As we read um, uh, through the Old Testament, we read all the prophecies, all the scriptures that Jesus came to fulfill in the New Testament. Um, so we're going to go through it, and we're going to break it down, verse 18 through 21. All right, uh, verse 18, let's begin reading. It says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. Um, in the beginning part of verse 18, uh, many parts of scripture we read where it, um, it says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I am well pleased. So the main, the main scripture where we read this was when he was baptized, right? What, what, what did... How can I say this? What did God say when Jesus was baptized? Some of you guys remember? What did God tell Jesus? What did God tell the crowd? What did, what did God tell him? None of you guys know? Okay, let's turn to verse uh, chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, all right? Got to go over this. Okay, it, in this scripture we read, um, 
when John baptizes Jesus, all right? Uh, we're going to read from verse 13 to 17. Okay, and it says, verse 13, Matthew chapter 3, it says, And Jesus came, came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? He's asking Jesus, like, I, you need to baptize me, not me baptize you. All right, it says, verse 15, But Jesus answered him and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Verse 16, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up, Immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and enlightening upon him. Then suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we read here that what was said in Isaiah, God said to Jesus, This is my beloved Son. He was well pleased in 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 God being, in Jesus being baptized. So we read this in many other scriptures. I'm going to fill out the board here. All right. So um, we also read it in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. You guys are writing that down. In Mark chapter 1, verse 11, we also read that Jesus says this to, that God says this to Jesus that, um, Jesus is my beloved son. What is that, Jojo? Mark 1.11. Mark 1.11 and in Luke 3.22, we read the same account. They're all the same accounts, but they're all from different perspectives. All right? And uh, when it says, well, please, well, please is to think well of or to delight in, to delight in something. When you're well pleased, you're pleased in something, Right? You're pleased in doing something. You're pleased in feeling this, this, this certain way. Sometimes you're pleased and when you, after you eat, you're like, mm, you're delighting in the food you're eating. All right? So let's keep reading. And it, um, the second half of verse 18, it says, I will put my spirit upon him. Now, the spirit was when he was baptized, obviously, um, in Matthew chapter, uh, in the verse we just read in Matthew 3.17, we read how the Spirit came down like a dove upon Jesus. That was the signifying of the Spirit coming down upon him. Now, as for us, we, the Spirit came down upon us when we accepted Jesus. When we fully accepted Jesus with all our hearts, the Spirit came down, came down upon us. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides within us, within our hearts. You can say it's kind of like our conscience. But the Spirit came down upon us. All right? And let's keep reading. He says, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles um, were those who weren't Jews, anyone who wasn't a Jew. Now, most I don't think any of you guys are Jews. So we're Gentiles, most of us. So, um, but when we became believers, um, there's no difference between Jew or Gentile between us, all right? We can read that in um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, and Romans chapter 10, verse 12. We read how in one, I mean, in Christ, we are one. We are all one body. We are all the church. We are all one body. Either Jew, Gentile, Greek, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Hispanic, if you're white, if you're American, it doesn't matter. We are all one. Christ Jesus, because he, he died for all of us. We are all covered with his blood. We are all one. All right? So let's go to verse 19. 19, it says, He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Now, uh, I'm reading from the New King James, but I like how uh, um, this verse is... Um, Read in the New Living Translation, and it says, so verse 19, He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. Now, many times in scriptures we read how um, Jesus obviously raises his voice. But he raises his voice in a way 
in, especially when he's teaching, he raises his voice. So that, because if you guys um, remember, uh, most of the time he was surrounded by multitudes, right? Mostly surrounded by multitudes. So if he spoke quietly, obviously the multitudes weren't going to hear him. So most of the time he raised his voice. So um, the main scriptures uh, uh, that came to mind were John 7, 28 and 37. Th these scriptures were when he was teaching in the temple. He raised his voice. Now it says right here he will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. So he wasn't, it, this scripture is, he wasn't going to fight with people, argue with people. Most of, the time, most of the time, Jesus raised his voice to teach. He raised his voice with compassion. Obviously, most of the times, when our parents raise their voices, when they're angry, right? When they're angry at us, then, then they raise their voice. But Jesus raised his voice with love, with compassion. That's when he raised his voice. Most of the times, when we raise our voice, it's when we're angry, right? When we're wanting to yell at our brother or sister, that's when we raise our voice. But, yeah, I see you laughing back there. But Jesus raised his voice to share that which the people needed. The people needed to hear the word of God. The people needed that, that love and compassion. People were broken, and Jesus gave them that which they so much needed. They needed healing. He gave them healing. He, they needed the word. He gave them the word. All right? So let's go on to verse 20. It says, A bruised reed... He will not break. Sorry, whoops, back up a bit. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Whoa, 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 where am I? Sorry, yes, verse 20. A bruised weight he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. So this verse is kind of confusing. It says a bruised reed he will not break. Um, Again, I like it how, how, how it explains in the New Living Translation, and it reads, still verse 20, He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious. All right, so we got to break this verse down just a little bit because um, obviously we don't, we don't understand what the reed and the candle is all um, displaying. All right, so, but in this verse it says, the weakest reed is a sign of a broken person, of a person who's broken, of a, bro a person who, who is um, who's brought down with guilt. Sometimes when we sin, we feel that guilt in our hearts, or we should feel that guilt in our hearts. If, if, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we should feel that guilt, that brokenness. Um, Jesus, it says, it says in the verse that he will not crush the weakest reed which means he will not put, put that guilt upon us. He won't, he won't say, hey, you sinned, that's on you. You're guilty. God won't do that to us. God is the greatest doctor. So what, what, what is he going to do? He's going to bind us up. He's going to um, heal us. And this verse explains um, the, how... The bruised, this is what I got from a commentary upon this verse, and I'll read it. It says, the bruised reed is a person broken by the weight of sorrow, which is usually brought down, the person is brought down. But Jesus came to heal and bind up the broken person, or in this verse, bind up the reed. He will not crush the broken reed, all right? So... In ver no, not the ver in verse. Uh, the s he says, the broken reed he will not break. The smoking flax. The smoking flax is a flickering candle. Now, a uh, flickering candle is a candle that is no longer burning. The flickering candle is just, is usually when you put it out, you see the smoke at the end. That's the flickering candle. The flickering candle is when in this verse is when there's no more light shining forth from us. Is when our light has grown dim, right? We are the light of the world. We have to be the light of the world. But in this verse, the flickering candle is when there's no more light shining forth from us. 
Now, Jesus came to be the light, and he came to give us light. Now, in the commentary I read, it says that Jesus didn't just come to light us. He came to give us the oil that burns forever, which is the Word. The Word is the oil we need in our lamps. Now, we shine forth that which we have, which is Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. We read it many times in Scripture. Jesus is the light of the world. Now, we came to shine forth, not us. We didn't come to shine. We came to shine forth that which came to shine for the world. We come to represent the Lord. We come to shine forth to the world, Jesus. All right? And it says, as we continue to read, till he sends forth justice to victory. Now, justice is a principle of righteousness. Justice means um, the principle of righteousness or truth. Now, Jesus is truth, right? Jesus is the truth. Yes or no? Yes, Jesus is truth. Now, truth at the end of days, at the end of the day when the Lord comes back, everything will be destroyed, right? What will be the only thing standing? Jesus, right? Jesus will be the only thing standing. And what I read in the, in the commentary, it says, Truth will at last stand. God's judgment will be brought forth to victory, whom when he judges, he will overcome. At the end, Jesus will be victorious. Sin is all over the world. Sin, yes, sin is in us. We're human. But at the end, when Jesus comes back, in Revelation we read how the people will come forth to fight against Jesus. They will come and want to war against Jesus. But Jesus, it says that Jesus will sway his sword and he'll destroy everybody. Everyone will be destroyed. Who will stand? Jesus. And hopefully we, will, we all in this room will stand with Jesus because we stand for the truth. Truth will stand. It always does. If you're telling the truth, it will stand, okay? All right, that's what it is talking about here. Now let's read verse 21. And his name, Gentiles, will trust. In the New Living Translation, again, I like how it reads. And his name will be the hope of all the world. I like how it says that here, of all the world, not just of the Gentiles. Yeah, most of the world is Gentile because not everyone's a Jew. But it says his name will be the hope of all the world. Hope is to trust in, is to wait for, is to look for. What is our hope? You, some, do you guys know what our hope is, what we hope in, what we wait for, what we look for? Any of you guys? None of you guys? Yes. When Jesus comes back, that is our hope. Our hope is that Jesus will come back soon that Jesus will come back anytime soon. We hope, we pray, you know. Many of us adults, that's what we hope for, that he comes back in any minute now. But we just got to trust in the Lord. That's what we trust in, that the Lord is going to come back soon. In Paul, in, when Paul was writing, Paul in his day, all the way, many, 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 many years ago, he he. He said it's the last days. Paul said it's the last days. The Lord is coming back soon. Look how many years have passed, and the Lord still hasn't come back. But that's our hope. That's what we trust in. We trust in that the Lord is going to come for his church. He's going to come for us. But the thing is, we have to be ready for him. All right? So um, we're going to turn to, all right, be ready. Psalms 39, verse 7. Psalms 39. I love the book of Psalms, right? So that's where I get all my, my references, all right? Psalms 39, verse 7. Now, these are, I'm reading small verses, but these verses are very meaningful. Psalms 37, oh, sorry, 39, verse 7. 39, verse 7, all right? And it says, are you guys there? You guys ready? All right, and it says, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? 
My hope is in you. Let's read verse 8. It says, Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me a reproach. Make me the reproach of the foolish. So it says right here, what do I wait for? What do we wait for? We wait for the Lord. We're waiting for the Lord. And we will continue to wait for the Lord. But as we continue to wait for the Lord, guess what? We're still in this world. We're still in the world. We're still here. We still struggle. But guess what? We, we continue to wait. I wish the Lord would come back now at this moment, like boom. But the Lord, it's not his time yet. It's not his time to come and bring judgment. God has a perfect time. He's not, he's not slack. God has a perfect time. All right? Now, turn to Psalms chapter 71. Psalm 71. All my, most of my references are in Psalms, all right? So I'm going to be in Psalms a lot. Psalm 71, verse 5. Psalm 71, verse 5. You guys there? Some of you guys still turning? You guys there? All right. Let's read. It says, um, verse 41. Sorry, verse 41. Sorry, verse 4. 71, verse 4. Deliver me. Oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and the cruel men. For you are my hope, O oh God. You are my trust from my youth. From my youth. This, this fits you guys because you guys are youth, obviously. But Jesus should be what we hope in. Jesus should be what we trust in. Even what, when we're going through difficult times, we obviously have to lean on somebody to, to, to bring us up, right? Lean on somebody to, to encourage us, right? Who should we lean on? People are going to fail us all the time. People are always going to turn their back on us when we're going through difficult times. But Jesus is always by our side. Jesus is always there to give us that hand, pick us up. We should trust in the Lord. We should hope in the Lord, all right? All right, we're going to go to one more chapter in Psalms. Let's go to 119. Psalms 119. Don't fall asleep on me, you guys, okay? 119, verse 81. You guys got to look for it, right? 119 is the longest chapter in Psalms. Verse 81. And it says, 119, you're there? Come on, David. 119 verse 81. All right, and it says, My soul faints for your salvation, but my hope, but I hope in your word. Our soul faints, my soul faints in your salvation. The salvation, our salvation, our walk in the Lord, it's not easy. All right, it's not a walk in the park. We're walking onto a battlefield. It's not raining candies from heaven, bro. It's raining fiery darts of the evil one. Okay? It's not easy. My soul faints for, for your salvation. It's difficult. We're going to grow weary. We're going to grow tired. As adults who have been, um, if you ask anybody who's been in the, in, saved, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to live for the Lord because trials come. They knock you down. Sometimes you don't want to get back up. But it says, but I hope in your word. We hope in the Lord. We hope in the word. That will lift us up. That gives us strength. That renews our strength. All right. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 12. Okay, so now we're going to begin. Now we're going to start verse 22 through 23. All right. So, oh, there it is. All right. So, so verse 22, we're going to read. 
Um, the subtitle right here in my Bible says a house divided cannot stand. We're obviously not going to go through the whole through the whole section here. We're just going to go through verse 22 to 23. All right, so let's begin reading. Verse 22, it says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. So we see here, a demon-possessed man is brought to Jesus. All right? He was also blind and mute. He couldn't speak. He couldn't see. But he was demon-possessed. Many times in scriptures we read how a demon-possessed man was brought to him. Sometimes he just comes to Jesus. All right? So, um, if you guys are writing notes, jot down these scriptures. You guys, If you guys have time to read them, you can read how demon-possessed man was brought to him. It's... Okay, it's in Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20, verse 1 through 20. Luke chapter 8, verse 26 through 38. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through chapter 9, verse 1. And then Mark chapter 5, verse 2 through 21. And then Luke chapter 4, verse 33 through 37. What was that? Mark chapter 5, verse 2 through 21. Luke chapter 4, verse 33 to 37. We see here how many times demon-possessed men were brought to Jesus. Many times, um, actually one time, a demon-possessed man came to Jesus. And bowed before him and fell before him. All right? And Jesus Jesus doesn't just leave him there and say, oh, you're demon possessed. Oh, oh well. I'll be praying for you. No, he heals him. He releases. He frees the person who is demon possessed. Sometimes we, there could be a demon tormenting us. There can't be a demon within us because the Holy Spirit resides in us. The light can't mix with the darkness. But there can be... Demons tempting us and tormenting us. But that's when we should lean upon the Lord. That's when we, we realize our hope is in the Lord. Yeah, we're going through something difficult. Yeah, we're going through a hard time. But our hope is in God. Our trust is in the Lord. He's the one that gives us the strength to be able to stand through the trial. Look at Job, for instance. Job got everything taken away from him. Everything, his kids, his livestock, his home, everything taken away from him. I think Jesus, just, the demon just for, forgot to take his wife because his wife was telling him the curse got in his face. He was probably like, hey, you forgot her. But, but everything was taken away from him, everything. But what, was his, what did he hope in? What did he trust in? He trusted in the Lord. He said, in, he, Job said, I came here with nothing and I will leave with nothing. Job said that. Why? Because he, tr he knew that this was from God. God was pr allowing this because nothing happens without God's permission, you could say. Nothing comes to, to, in our lives without God's permission. God allows things to happen to us. To strengthen us, sometimes we, we fall. Yeah, we fall sometimes. Sometimes tests are difficult and we, we, we can't, we don't pass the test, you could say. We fall, but our trust is in the Lord. Our hope is in the Lord. He's the one that allows us to go through things, to strengthen us. Not to bring us down, not to... Not to harm us, but to strengthen us. Sometimes we, we don't see the blessing behind the trial, behind what's going on in our lives. But there's hidden blessings in everything that happens. All right? That's what Job, that's what Job 
saw, Job saw a blessing. Even though he was covered in boils from head to toe, even, th even though he lost everything, he still blessed the Lord. He still glorified his name because that's what he trusted in. Because he knew that the Lord had given him everything he had and that the Lord was allowing everything to be stripped from him. And at the end of it all, Job passed the test. And everything was given back to him and more because he continued to trust in the Lord. All right? So, um, verse 23. I like how it says in the New Living Translation, the, uh, how it says in the verse 23. But we're going to read it in New King James, and then I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. All right? And it says here, verse 23, And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? And in the New Living Translation, still verse 23, it says, The crowd was amazed and asked, Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? All right? So, um, in Scripture, we read how... How Jesus would obviously, the prophecies of Jesus coming from the lineage of David. All right, so if you're writing, writing notes, jot these verses down. All right, I'm giving you guys a lot of verses, so. All right, so it's Numbers 24, verse 17. Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, obviously, in these verses, it's difficult to tell that they're speaking of the lineage of David, but you got to be really careful to read it as you read it to really understand it. All right, the obvious verses also, I'm going to give you two more. It's Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 through 6, and 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. Now, the word Messiah is a Hebrew word, and it means anointed one or chosen one, all right? In the Old Testament, um, uh, prophets, priests, and, and kings, they were anointed to set themselves apart for, for a specific responsibility. Um, there's one main, main and big figure in the Bible that was anointed. Some of you guys know who he is. None of you guys know? None of you guys know he was anointed in front of his brothers? Yes, David. Not you, but David. Huh? <laughs> no, no, not your brother either. All right? Hey, hey, shh, shh, hey, bring him back to you guys, okay? But it was David from the Bible. Now, David... He was anointed to be king. He, now, he was anointed. Now, he didn't become king till years later. But he was set apart for that specific responsibility of being king. All right? Now, anointing was a sign of God of him choosing you or consecrating you for his work. Now, consecration is um, you're being dedicated for a purpose. Now, God was dedicating you for a specific person, per, uh, uh, purpose. Now, an example us, we were anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, we were anointed. Why were we anointed? You guys know why? You guys don't know why? We were anointed to serve the Lord. We were anointed to share the, His Word, to be the light of the world. That's what we were anointed for. We were anointed... For the Lord. That's what he was setting us apart for. For the Lord. All right? Now, um, I'm going to give you guys some verses for so you guys can read. Or if you guys want to turn there, sure, go ahead. Uh, let's turn actually to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. I hope you guys know where 1 Samuel is, huh? 
Oh, sorry. Chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, verse... Let's see. Mm. Let's start reading at verse 11. Now, here we're going to start reading. Um, Samuel... Is it Samuel? I think so. Yes. Samuel goes to the um, family of Jesse to go find a king. God sent him to go to Jesse to, to anoint one of his sons. Now, all of his sons had came before him, and Samuel was like, he's the one. He's good looking. He's buff. He looks like Jabbar. And, um, you know, <laughs> and, you know he, Samuel was like, he's going to be the one. He's the next king. But Samuel was looking at that that was exterior. God was looking at the heart. All right, so let's read in verse 11. It says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Verse 12, So he sent and brought him. Now he was ready with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is a one. Verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from, the day, from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So we see here that David comes and he's anointed. Samuel anoints him. Because the God has already chosen him. God has already appointed him to be king. All right? And we see here that when he was anointed, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only came upon certain people, certain people which God chose. Now, at a certain time, the Holy Spirit could leave the person if God chose that to be. Now, for us nowadays in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon us and He's there. He's there. He resides in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Just as the scriptures say, the, the, sorry, the Holy Spirit resides in us, lives in us. Now, we see here that once Samuel anointed him, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, we see here that Samuel anointed him. And from that day forward, the Holy Spirit resided in him. All right? Now, if you guys continue reading forward, um, David goes through a lot of difficulty. He faces the giant. Um, he has to face Saul, which tries to kill him in many instances. If you guys were with us on Wednesday nights, you guys will remember how Saul tried to kill David a bunch of times. But... God didn't allow Saul to, to kill David. Why? Because God had already appointed him to take Saul's place. All right? Saul, the, uh, Saul was king. The Holy Spirit was with him. But once he disobeyed, the Holy Spirit left Saul. And that's when he was tormented by the demon. No, sorry, yes. He was tormented. Then David... David actually came to work in, in, in the palace to try to ease Saul's torment. Not knowing, Saul didn't know that David was going to be king. But guess what? He was there. He was there. And David was going to take Saul's place. All right? And let's turn to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. All right, we're almost done here, you guys, okay? Exodus 29. 29 verse 7. Verse 7, all right? And we're going to read here how priests 
were anointed. All right. Verse 7, it says, And you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Verse 8, it says, Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them, and you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for per, per, perpetual statute, and you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. So we read here how Aaron and his sons were consecrated to be priests, to be the priesthood. Now they had to be anointed as well because the Lord was setting them apart for a specific responsibility. Now God has anointed us for, for, for a specific responsibility, which is to be the light for the Lord. All right? We were anointed. Now the Holy Spirit is always in us. Yeah, we're going to fall. Yeah, it's difficult. We understand that. Sometimes we, we forget that. But we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always resides in us. All right. So, mm, let's turn. We're going to be going back and forth, right, guys? Let's turn to Luke. Luke chapter 4. Go to the New Testament now. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Verse eight, 18. All right, so um, the scripture here, the verses here we're going to read, they're from, from the book of Isaiah. I'll give you the verses uh, after we're done reading it. Okay, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover and recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now we see here how Jesus was proclaiming scripture. He was proclaiming from Isaiah that which is spoken of Jesus. Now it says here that he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, in our case, we weren't just supposed to preach the gospel to the poor. We were supposed to preach the gospel to the whole world. That's what God sent us out for, to preach the gospel to the entire world. That's why he told the disciples. That's how why he sent out the disciples. Share the gospel to the whole world. All right? And it continues. It says, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, we're to preach the gospel to share him who can heal the brokenhearted, which is Jesus. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. So we are to share Jesus to the brokenhearted to the sick. And it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Who is the one who can set us free? God, Jesus. He sets us free. Just like Paul. Paul was in chains. He was in prison. But he was singing for the Lord. Praising the Lord. Bless you. He was singing in prison. He was in chains, but guess what? He was free. He was in prison, but he was free because the Lord was in him. The Lord resided in him. The Lord gave him freedom. Now, our freedom doesn't give us the ability to sin all we want and then say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Okay, let's go back to sinning. Let's do whatever we want. It's the weekend. Let's go party it up. No. That's not the freedom God gives us. God gives us the freedom of choice. He, get, he, he allows us to choose right between wrong. 
But the, that's what the Holy Spirit's for, to convict us. All right? And it says, to recover the sight to the blind. Now, obviously, we can't heal the blind person, right? I wish we could, but we can't, right? We don't have the, the ability to do that. But in this sense, the blind person is him who is living in darkness. When you're in a dark room, you can, you can barely, if you're in the, like a really, really dark room, you can barely see your hand in front of you sometimes. But to recover the sight to the blind, it's like flashing the light on in a dark room. We were once blind when we were walking in darkness, when we were walking in sin. We were once blind. You guys are young. You guys don't know what it is to live in the world. It's, it's in the moment. But after, after all the moments gone, it's all darkness. That's all it is. It's all darkness. And the Lord is the light of the world. He comes to shine forth for us. Just like in the Psalms it says, Your word is a light to my feet. A light to my path. God has a path for us. Now his word shines forth the path on which he wants us to walk, on which he wants us to go. He shines the light. He recovers the sight of the blind. He opens the eyes to those who, who are living in sin, to those who are walking in darkness. All right, and it, can, it continues to say, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. When you're oppressed, when you're tormented, you feel, you feel the guilt. You feel the pressure. You don't want to do anything. You're depressed. You're stressed, especially now with COVID and everything. People, there's a pandemic of anxiety, depression. Those are the chains that the devil uses to keep us captive, to keep us down, to keep us from getting up. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to break those chains of depression, of anxiety, of guilt. Jesus came to break those chains. That's why he died on the cross for us. He came to break the chains of darkness that were holding us captive. He came to set, he came to give us liberty, came to give us freedom. In verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, there's no specific year for the Lord because Jesus, His year is every year. His day is every day. I got you, eh? His day is every day. We came to proclaim Him every day. Now, sometimes we don't proclaim Him with shouting in the streets like some people do. But there's a saying that says sometimes the only Bible somebody's going to read is your life. We proclaim the Lord with how we live. We proclaim the Lord with how we act. We proclaim the Lord with how we talk. That's how we proclaim the Lord. And in those instant opportunities that God gives us to preach the gospel, to preach the word, to share about Him, we have to take hold of those opportunities. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't take hold of the opportunities that God gives us to share the gospel, to proclaim the Lord. We don't take hold of it. And sometimes, yeah, we feel guilty. We feel guilty of not proclaiming the Lord. But the Lord gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to proclaim liberty, to proclaim the freedom that God gives us. All right. Um, oh, I love this scripture. Turn to First John. First John. First John, chapter, chapter two. It's a small book. If it's hard to find, you'll take your time. You'll find it. First John, chapter two, verse twenty. Verse 20, 
and it reads and says, but you have an anointed anointing from the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So same thing. We were anointed because we know the truth. What is the truth about us? That we're sinners, that we're guilty, and that we need someone to free us from sin. We need someone to forgive us. And God has forgiven us. If you are truly, truly, full-heartedly brokenhearted, and you've come to the Lord with all your heart, you are truly set free. That's the truth, that we are guilty sinners, and that God has come to save us. That's the truth. That's, the, that's why we were anointed, because we, we figured out all of a sudden one day that we're sinners. And we, need, we need salvation. We need help. All right? All right, so we, you guys got to remember that. We're here. We're anointed by the Lord to preach the word, to share the gospel. All right, we're not just anointed just just because the Lord felt like it, but the Lord chose you for His specific purpose. All right, so let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the scriptures, Lord, that you um, gave us today, Lord. We pray, Father God, Lord, that we may always keep them in our hearts. And we may remember, Lord, that you have chosen us for a specific purpose, Lord, that you have given us the opportunities, Lord, to share your word, to share your scriptures, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we may always keep it in our hearts, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as we go out this day today, Lord, that you may be glorified and honored, Lord. That we may give you that glory and honor, Lord, that you deserve, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen.